Greetings, everyone. And on behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to another installment of City Lights Live, the virtual component of the City Lights events calendar. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis, and tonight we are delighted to be co-hosting along with our friends at Synergetic Press and the Chakruna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicines, an evening of discussion and presentations in celebration of the publication of the book, Women in Psychedelics, Uncovering Invisible Voices. It's published by Synergetic Press. Before we begin, as is customary, I would like to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ramatishaloni peoples. Numerous dialects of their languages have been spoken along this peninsula. We'd like to offer our respects to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. In the ongoing and ever-expanding conversations focused upon psychedelic medicines and their innumerable histories, women's voices and narratives have often been excluded and even suppressed. Tonight, we hope to explore the profound contributions that women have made to the area of psychedelic research and aim to generate a path to exploration moving beyond a patriarchal lens. We aim to understand the role of women in psychedelic history and in the emergent present. The book, Women and Psychedelics, Uncovering Invisible Voices is the template from which we will work tonight. We are honored to have with us many of the contributors to this remarkable collection. Moderating the panel will be Fernanda Barriabar of Synergetic Press. Fernanda is a transpersonal psychologist, marketing specialist, writer, and shamanic practitioner. She has worked extensively with the Cuero communities of Peru and is pursuing a master's in spirituality, consciousness, and transpersonal psychology at the Aleph Trust with the aim of furthering the research of parapsychological phenomenon. Joining her in discussion tonight will be one of the book's co-editors, Erica Dick, who is a world-renowned historian and professor and Canadian chair research chair in the history of health and social justice at the University of Saskatchewan. She is the author and editor of several books. These include Psychedelic Psychiatry, published in 2008, Psychedelic Prophets, uh, published in 2018, and the book Psychedelics, A Visual Odyssey, as well as many others. Professor Dick is currently the president of the Alcohol and Drugs History Society. We will also be joined tonight by the educator, folk herbalist, community organizer, and entheogen facilitator, Michaela Di Lamico. She is an educator and activist who has collaborated with hundreds of organizations within the sacred earth medicine space and is well known as a maternal caretaker in the community. Her most recent project is Mothers of the Mushroom, which is an open source research and resources project focusing on how psychedelics can benefit families. Also with us tonight will be Dr. Maria Mangini, we have had the pleasure of hosting Professor Mangini in the past at City Lights. She is a lifelong researcher on drugs and drug policy, also former program director of Masters in Science and Nursing at Holy Names College, where she was based for over 20 years. She is also a colleague of uh, medical cannabis, cannabis pioneer Frank Lucindo, MD, and is the co-founder of Women's Visionary Council. She is currently doing research in the study of death and dying. Also joining us will be Belinda Iracho, she is of Navajo and Pueblo of Zuni descent. She is the wisdom carrier, healer, and founder of, Ka I'm not sure if I'm going to get the pronouncing right, Kalogi, I believe. Uh, you thank you. An organization focusing on cultural and traditional teaching and inner healing. She has spoken nationally and internationally on various topics impacting Native American communities in the United States. She is also a founder and board member of the Church of the Eagle and the Condor, a program advisor for Naropa University and a Native American traditional advisor for Sound Mind. She also contributed to the book Psychedelic Justice toward a, towards a Diverse and Equitable Psychedelic Culture, which is also published by Synergetic Press. So join us now in welcoming our esteemed panel. I will turn it over now to Fernanda of Synergetic Press to get the evening started. Welcome, everyone. It is an honor to have you with us. Thank you, Peter. That was an amazing introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, we have such an exciting event uh, for you guys today. Uh, we're going to have amazing presentations by our amazing speakers. Um, but before we start, I just wanted to give a little bit of a synopsis about women and psychedelics and this amazing book that we've published with the Chakuna Institute. 
Um, for some of you that may not know the Chakuna Institute too well, um, I just wanted to present the organization as well. Um, it's an incredible institution dedicated to bridging the gap between indigenous knowledge and modern psychedelic science. Uh, founded by Bia Labata, eh, Labate, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Bia. The Institute focuses on promoting cultural understanding, social justice, and inclusivity within the psychedelic community. We've also published a few other books um, together, uh, Queering Psychedelics and Psychedelic Justice. And uh, today we're going to be focusing on Women and Psychedelics, which was edited by Erica Dyke and among other contributors as well. Um, so this amazing book, it is a collection of essays, of research papers, and personal stories that delve into the roles and experiences of women um, inside the psychedelic movement. Um, it has a lot of historical perspectives, of course, and it talks about all the different women that have contributed um, that we may not know about or may know about um, since the 1960s in the counterculture. So it's incredibly such an incredible take on the history that we know and love. Um, and the beautiful aspect of it is also the social justice and the therapeutic aspects that we see that are contributed in the book. Um, issues of health therapy and mental health that have affected women, the trauma, depression, um, and PTSD. So that's also very interesting topics that we'll be delving into today. Um, but without further ado, because the speakers have incredible um, things to say, I'm going to start to pass the conversation to them um, so we can start to, to really delve into the topics of the book. Um, so we will start with our beautiful speaker, Erica Dick. Um, I believe that she'll be able to share her screen with us shortly. Soon, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the host now, so I think you'll be able to share. Perfect. Does that work? Yeah. Looking great. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, um, I am coming to you from Treaty 6 territory in the traditional homeland of the Métis people in Canada, um, here in the province of Saskatchewan, uh, where we are about to have a thunderstorm. So this could be a fun ambiance. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. This is my, my second time doing a, a virtual talk at City Lights, a, a place that really looms large in the history of psychedelics and I think has such an important role to play in bringing together and stimulating some of these conversations. So it's really a treat to be with you all here tonight, um, even virtually connecting in that space. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the book and tell a few stories about um, how this book got started, but also to try to give a sense of where we were coming from in our ideas behind women in psychedelics, which was beyond um, adding women to the mix, but really started trying to think carefully about the role that women have played in stimulating different ideas about psychedelics, but also about how we take care of each other in that context. And so I'll use a couple of images here just to give a sample, and it's certainly not comprehensive um, dealing with some of the, the articles that exist. Um, you'll probably recognize Grace Slick up there. I will call her Acid Queen, as many others did. Um, and uh, she certainly sort of represents a particular kind of, of feminist um, stance in this space. And below her is probably someone um, who you may not know, um, but whose husband was quite famous. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment as well. Uh, Jane Osmond was the wife of Humphrey Osmond, who gives us the word psychedelic. And there she is with her granddaughter, Chelsea Osmond, who I've continued to work with as she also makes sense of of her grandfather's legacy and what it means to her growing up in Nashville, um, uh, an African-American girl who she said, you know, she has this white um, Anglo-British uh, accented grandfather and what it has meant for her to be living in the shadow of this psychedelic space. And in the middle there, there's an image uh, from a, uh, an artist named Rene Alvaro, uh, who has taken, he's, he's in his twenties and he lives in Mexico, and he takes um, soil from around where Maria Sabina lived. 
And he uses that as the basis for the pigmentations that he uses in his art, as he is re, uh, rethinking a, a kind of way of using art to honor Maria Sabina. And I just, I wanted to sort of point to these images just to give you a sense of a, a bit of the flavor of the book and hopefully some of the diversity that you'll encounter as you look at this and hopefully what the book inspires, which is continued conversations about this kind of diversity of women's perspectives. Um, so I wanted to just, I'll just say a few things quickly here. I, I'm i a historian. I've been working in this space in psychedelics for almost 25 years now, and I'm often learning from my children. Uh, this one is now 11 years old and downstairs, probably watching YouTube or something. Um, but here she was standing in a museum exhibit with this image in front of her face of these suffragettes, and she wouldn't let me take her picture. And I, it's become kind of a meta moment, both me learning from my daughter, but also reflecting on my role as a historian and thinking about the way that we are also doing histories for the future or doing histories, in this case, for, for my daughter. Uh, my son happened to be outside of the frame here, but it ends up being this kind of meta moment for me. So that's part of the inspiration behind this book as well, to think not only about capturing the history for history's sake, but also for changing the script or changing the story as we move forward. I'm really fortunate to um, some of the images that I, uh, this one is shared by Stacey Schaefer, are, are really these incredible images that people have collected. Uh, this one too, I think really helps to ground us and represent some of the ways that women have been involved in, uh, I'll call it psychedelics, but in plant medicines, in securing, cultivating and protecting knowledge around plant-based medicines for a long time. Uh, this of course comes from the peyote gardens. Um, and I wanted to start this, um, by thinking about what it means to have mothers of a movement or what would it look like if instead of looking at the fathers of different movements, we looked at mothers in this case of psychedelics. So the origin story behind the book is perhaps laughable, but I'll I'll share it with you and you can decide if it is um, funny or not. Um, so Bia Labache and I were sitting in her kitchen. Uh, this is a lovely photograph taken by her wife, Clancy Kavnar, who's also an editor on this book. And she kind of dared me. She's like, you know, we should do a series on women in psychedelics. And I said, so I put out a, a tweet a tweet, a tweet, I guess I tweeted it. Um, and we thought, well, we'll just do one a week until we run out of content. And at about 70, I said I needed to take a break. We did one a week for uh, about 70 weeks. I think we took one week off over the Christmas holidays. Um, and it was really inspiring. The, the number of uh, responses we got, um, but also we went out sort of scouring to try to find different places where we might draw attention to women's voices. Uh, we used our own networks, but they also sort of piggybacked on the networks of people that we began identifying or knew from our own work. Um, and that is why we, we were able to first produce an issue in Spanish, uh, the English edition, which we're celebrating here, has slightly has about seven new articles in it, um, and there are many, many more on the website. And I just want to emphasize that we really mean for this to be the beginning of a conversation, something that inspires continued work on this to showcase the multiple ways that women have been involved in this history. A few snapshots, um, women behind the scenes. Um, I'll just choose a couple of examples here. Simone de Beauvoir, you know, no slouch as a feminist in her own right, um, but her some of her connections to psychedelics have often been kind of muted or behind the scenes, if you will. But if it were not for her friendship with Jean-Paul Sartre, and if it were not for her careful, diligent note-taking, we might not know about his uh, fated masculine experience, which is sort of... Um, caricatured in this, he had crustaceans following him around. And so you see these kinds of images, um, but it's Simone de Beauvoir who helped to make sense of that and whose writings helped to capture that moment, which was really important for French philosophy, um, but also important for their friendship. There are also notorious women. This one is done by, I should say that article was written by Patrick Farrell. This one by Nidia Hernandez um, talks about Lola Shata, who is this notorious woman whose, whose name and infamy spills through newspapers in Mexico as perhaps the most important drug lord at the time. Um, she's incredible, she's powerful, she's uh, a criminal in this respect, but also uh, Nidia brings real humanity to her and gives a different face to the, to the way that she managed herself and also became a household name. Sorry. 
And we also have a number of forgotten women. Um, Susie Ramstein, which uh, Maria Mangini and I wrote this article, the first woman to take LSD uh, was Albert Hoffman's uh, lab assistant um, and had been sort of forgotten in history were it not for, for um, people like Susan, Suzanne Seiler and Maria Mangini who kind of rescued her from the dustbins of history and drew attention to her work and also the very careful notes that she took um, before she changed her name and was in, in many ways lost to history. And I tried to sort of create this aggregate article, Mrs. So-and-so, to represent some of the ways that women have been lost in this history, partly because their names were changed or never recorded in the first place, but as a way of just giving us a bit of a sample or a sense of how women have been participating in auxiliary ways in trials. Uh, women behind the science um, some of these are women like Susie Ramstein, a lab assistant, and others, like this woman featured here on Beat Bachi's book cover, uh, were women who were patients whose um, rehabilitation involved, in this case, inoculating rye to ramp up the ergot production by Sandoz, of course, on the route to creating LSD. Um, so again, here, women whose names were entirely, never even recorded in this case. I'll just finish by saying, you know, this is just a tiny snapshot and we only have a few minutes and I want to hear from the other speakers, but I wanted to just sort of step back for a moment and reflect on what it means to produce a book like this. Um, and I hope, like I say, this is one of, of many to follow by others. Um, what we I think we've found in this and over those many, many um, conversations and posts is that we lose a lot when women's perspectives are forgotten or muted or downplayed in this. It's not just the stories of discovery of which there are some there too, but we lose some of the other parts of psychedelic history. Um, and, and it's not as it's not simple enough to say some of these caring parts, but there are whole swaths of history um, surrounding the place of set and setting, which we know is so incredibly important within the context of psychedelics. And much of that has been cultivated, recorded, and often inspired by women thinking outside the box when it comes to the relationship between pharmacology um, and therapy or pharmacology and caring. Um, and there are a variety of examples here. I'll quickly say Helen Bonney, of course, a music therapist in her own right and a, a um, a real, really important in inspiration, Betty Eisner, who not only was thinking about psychedelics and touch in really important ways, but was one of the few uh, psychiatric women in the 1950s. Um, Kay Parley, herself a nurse and guide. Um, and Eileen Garrett is the last one here on the right. She's a parapsychologist who also encouraged psychedelic thinkers to reach out to other ways of thinking about consciousness. Um, and she became the godmother to some of the Osmond children, uh, just as one kind of shout out to the ways in which she was very well connected to some of the major players in the 1950s. So with that, I want to thank you, and I, I look forward to hearing your questions and the comments from my other uh, colleagues. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Erica. That was super. That was amazing. Um, thank you for giving us a little bit of an introduction and synopsis of the book. Um, it sounds like there's just very interesting things that we've missed out greatly <laughs> in the history of how women have actually partaken in in these wonderful explorations. Um, I'd actually love to hear more about Sim Simone de Beauvoir's experience. <laughs> that sounds really, really interesting. Um, yeah, but thank you for giving us um, that view. Um, that was very, very great. Um, but we'll move over to the next speaker that we have for today. Um, Belinda, if you're ready to give us your your um, little presentation. I'm not sure if you are host now. I believe you are. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you so much, Erica. We'll get more into it with the questions later on. Um... Okay, am I good? Perfect. Okay, thank, thank you. Fernanda. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, everyone, for, for being with us this evening. Um, Today, I wanted to share a little bit about my the chapter that I wrote uh, in chapter one. This is not Native American history. This is US history with Belinda Aracho. I attempt to illustrate a few things. First of all, I try to um, illustrate that we each belong to a place due to our history of colonization. Our ancestors were removed or forced to leave for one reason or another. Second of all, we all have a collective consciousness that connects each and every one of us. 
our lineages have also had experience uh, intergenerational trauma in one form or another, um, whether it is through relocation or war. Colonialism is real. Um, this is just a little bit about my family. I come from the lineages of the Diné people on my mother's side and the Zuni people of New Mexico on my father's side. And colonialism actually touched my family in many ways and just a, year, just a few of them. The first one was the arrival of the conquistadors in the 1500s um, as they were searching for gold and riches in the Zuni Pueblo. Uh, the Zuni Pueblo was one of the one one of the small little uh, places that was known as uh, the, the one of the cities of gold that they told elaborate stories about. Um, and there's more that I'd love to share about my um, trip to Spain um, to kind of do with all of that kind of background research. Um, and then the picture on the bottom left hand side is an illustration of my Diné relatives and ancestors who were captured in the 1800s and marched to an internment camp where they lived for several years. My grandmother, great-great-grandmother, her name was Bishtibat, which translates to one who rides with the Braves, um, was two years old when she returned back to her homelands. And so we all share similar stories like this. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of flavor of, of my own personal story. What is colonialism? Um, you know, certainly one of the things we all recognize is it depends on who's defining it um, and the way that that definition is utilized. And there's really two definitions that I provide here. One is the um, Oxford Dictionary's uh, version, more of a Western approach, which really addresses some of the policy and practices of acquiring full or partial political control over a people. And a Native American um, definition is really about the external control upon us and expressions of subordination of Indian, Indian people and their rights um, at earlier contact with um, Europeans. One of the things I, I, that it made me re re recognize and um, in the experiences that I've had working in the psychedelic space is that um, colonialism is also the systems that are put in place for us as Native American um, communities, it really means the medical systems that are put in place um, by the federal government, which do not work for us. And um, when I also look at the psychedelic movement, uh, we continue to perpetrate um, colonialism in a lot of these systems. And we really need to start shifting our narrative that I'll touch on in a little bit. What is intergenerational trauma? Many of you are familiar with the term, um, but intergenerational trauma is the unjust treatment and control over people that causes trauma and negative consequence of that trauma um, that are passed from one generation to the next. So in my illustration I shared with you from the 1500s, the arrival of the conquistadors, um, little did I know that some of that would impact me. And even though it was back in the 1500s, I carried some of that rage and that anger within my own self. And the sacred plant medicines really helped me to kind of resolve and look at that in a different light. And so we come from these um, different viewpoints. One of the things that's very different about the trauma that we are experiencing in our Native American communities is that it's very complex. And why? Um, one of the reasons why is that a lot of times when trauma occurred, there was never time to grieve that loss until another traumatic event would happen. And we find ourselves today in that kind of mode where we're still trying to catch up um, with that healing process. Um, the other thing that is very different, as I've indicated, is the clinical settings in which we find ourselves for um, doing psychedelic psychotherapy. Um, is very different. You know, the um, cookie cutter templates that are outlined typically in a Western medical mindset do not work. And even the diagnosis that you find in the DSM do not fit um, traditional Native people and the complex uh, trauma that they go through. Um, the type of Native American, uh, Native American people really need a culturally specific way of healing that incorporates their, their way of being. And I'll touch on that in a little bit.
okay, something's going on. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the narratives and I'm not going to go through each of these points, but I did want to highlight a, a couple of things. I talked a little bit about the narratives in a way that we as women can really take this leadership role to really shift the narratives in our own communities, especially in BIPOC communities. Um, you know, from a colonial lens, it's really a power and control. Um, as stated earlier, it's a very paternalistic way of looking at things. Um, and we find that a lot of times the focus is on the division of the parts. Um, I always share the experience about the medical model that we use. There's psychology, there's sociology, and there's all these different parts. However, when you take, when you look at it from a Native American lens, there's this holism that we forget about and the connection that each of those have to one another. And so, you know, in our communities, there's a collaborative approach that we use to our healing where everybody gets involved in that community, which is a great um, thing to have, you know, when we're going through our psychedelic experience to be able to come in back into our community and know that there will be a sacred container to hold that healing process. Um, the other thing is this recognition of the interconnectedness to the whole. Um, and we forget about that, even the sacred plant medicines that we utilize, we are them and they are us. And we really need to shift that mindset, again, from a really maternalistic standpoint. And I think it's really an opportune time for women to step up and acknowledge that. So talk a little bit about changing the narrative. Um, as this movement expands, we need to lead with the heart and not with the mind. And I think that's one of the things we forget about. I remember a story that an elder once told me. She said the longest journey in life that we ever will walk is, the, is only 18 inches from our mind to our heart. And so I always think about that. And I think about my, my grandchildren and, and the legacy that I want to leave for them. Um, and this is something that is very innate in women um, as um, creation, you know, people that create. Um, this movement will not survive without the inclusion of the indigenous voices. Um, if we don't follow and we don't heed the warnings that have been shared, we will repeat history. The psychedelic um, space also needs to incorporate the traditional wisdom of the stewards of these sacred medicines. It's interesting because um, I find myself in this place where I'm going back and saying, hey, we really not need to start thinking about reciprocity. We need to give back to the traditional holders of these medicines. And we really need to find ways that are will conserve these medicines for the next generations to come. In addition, we also need to acknowledge that harm has been done to indigenous people and it continues. And then it really begs the question is what kind of legacy do we want to leave for our grandchildren? The strategies um, to coexist with nature within indigenous communities have worked for millennia. And this includes our relationship with the sacred plant relatives. And Western science needs to learn from these wisdom carriers as a way to bring that into the, the teachings. And I want to end with this um, quote from Chief Seattle, who was a chief of one of the Squamish people up in the state of uh, Washington as a reminder um, of the need for us to coexist with nature in this psychedelic movement. Humankind was not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together as things connect. So with that, I'll return it back to Fernanda. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. That was very beautiful, very beautiful. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, I know that you also work for the Condor and Eagle Foundation. And you know, they speak about the upcoming um connection, connection of the North and the South, and including indigenous voices into the Western world as, as a way to move forward into, into, like you say, the web of experience. Um, and it's also just very ironic and interesting how colonialism has caused all this generational trauma and in this new movement of psychedelic healing we're seeing us using these psychedelic tools and plant medicines to heal from colonialism which is quite an ironic 
ironic new um, outcome from all of this, but I'm sure that it's something that is is embedded in the web for all of us to to work past. Um, but thank you so much for the words. Um, and yeah, again, we'll get to it more more deep in the questions for sure. Um, so get your questions prepared as we're we're listening to the speakers. Um, and thank you so much. So we'll move to the third speaker of tonight, uh, Professor Maria Mangini. Um, she will be gracing us with a presentation as well, I believe. Um, Maria, could you, is she okay to take host now? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Although oh. I don't actually need to be the host because I don't have any slides to present. So oh, beautiful. We're having a great conversation. I just would be um, centered as the speaker. That would be a good move. Um, well, you know, it's very inspiring to be in the presence, not only of the um, the offerings that have uh, created this constellation of uh, information about psychedelic women and the activities of women around psychedelics, but of these very notable people whose lives are uh, a record of the achievements that um, women are uh, entitled to claim. Um, I... Um, I am descended from immigrants to this continent, and uh, there was a disruption of the traditions that my an ancestors practiced in Europe, which they brought with them when they um, came to this country. So um, for many reasons, I don't have the advantage of having a cultural container that is accepting and knowledgeable about the ways in which um, the ordinary reality that we inhabit most of the time um, is only one a uh, very specific version of what is it is possible to know and to experience. Um, and it is through the, the doorway of some of these um, molecules that were uh, the, the I, I have a particular fondness for LSD uh, myself because it's the doorway through which I myself and the culture which I am actually living in um, entered into the awareness that there were realms of consciousness similar to the ones that have been understood for many years by traditional people who had these um, traditions upon which to draw. And it was an opportunity for us to be able to re remediate some of the kind of stunting that occurs in a culture where people don't recognize the existence of these realms and hold them as sacred space. Um, I don't know whether you've ever seen a small child who was wearing an eye patch, but there's a an ailment that happens sometimes with children if the balance of the musculature in their eyes is not equal, if one eye is stronger and more able to direct the um, orientation of what it's focusing on than the other, that wandering eye, if it is allowed to wander during a particular part of the child's development, the, the ch it'll, it'll produce a double vision image, which is confusing. And it, as a developmental correction for that, a child's brain will eventually stop receiving the message from the eye that wanders. So that what, what the, the end product of that is that um, the person grows with a perfectly functional eye. There's nothing physiologically wrong with the eye, but the the messages that are received by the retina are not sent to the brain because the neural circuitry just does not form during that period. I think that there are a great many human capacities that are, are kind of similar to that. Um, in the tradition in which I was brought up, it was acknowledged that there were what were referred to as the preternatural gifts. Those were part of the normal human gift that we all should, as human beings, be expected to have possessed. But because of the, from uh, as a result of whatever caused the particular dogma that's addressing this issue might be um, uh, identifying as the, the cause of this loss, those had been lost to people. And I do think that psychedelics um, allow for the possibility of the reopening of some of those gifts, which are understood in other cultural contexts as real, um, uh, perhaps developmental milestones that people can achieve, but real possibilities for human beings. And I'm talking about things like being able to hold conversations with animals and plants, being able to do remote viewing of things that are not happening where your body is located, being able to travel through time. Those are things which many cultures throughout human history and all through human geography have really acknowledged that those are real possibilities. And I think that we've lost the, uh, the capacity to exercise those things and that psychedelics can 
potentially open us up to the revivification of those um, capacities and um, possibilities. And I, I find that to be one of the more interesting ways in which the uh, environment around psychedelics as it becomes more uh, conversational and people are less um, oppressed by the need for security because their uh, their sacred medicines are held to be uh, dangerous and reprehended by the larger society in which they are embedded. So I look forward to an opportunity to uh, experience these um, uh, the new realms of understanding that the that these um, potential um, tools and and gifts and um, and sacraments can give ac access to, and um, I I hope to be a respectful part of the lineage of uh, uh, the the holders of the cultures that have understood these capacities throughout history, and of the women who've been the uh, priestesses and often providers of the tools with which these realms could be accessed. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for that. That was, yeah, definitely very well, very incredibly said. Um, and yeah, I think with these, in these realms, as m the more we delve into this kind of contemporary field of the psych of psychedelic exploration, we tend to go back to things that we've already known and things that all of these ancient tribes have already told us. And we keep rediscovering and remembering all of these aspects of ourselves, the more we delve into our psyche and into our psychedelic exploration, which, which is beautiful. We know it's there. We know it's in the astral. Our ancestors are continuously reminding us of the potentials of our parapsychological phenomenon. So not so phenomenons really, we just call them that <laughs> for now, <laughs> but quite, I'm gonna say normal human capacities. Um, and speaking on women priestesses and the capacities that we have, I'd like to present uh, Michaela um, um, to come to speak to us as well as a contemporary priestess, I would say. I don't know if you'd call yourself that, but um, it's an honor to have you to have you here as a speaker. Um, so we'd love to to hear some of your words. Um, Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Maria, for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be here as I'm sitting and listening to in this circle of wise women and medicine carriers and important, important people in our community. Um, I sit with a lot of um, gratitude and humility to have been invited to this great circle. So thank you for sharing. Um, all of your wisdom with me as, um, you know, some of my elders tell me like, you know, um, passing the baton, if you will. And I tend to be one of the younger women in spaces like this. And so I continue to be very honored and very humbled by that. And so I just want to thank each and every one of the speakers for the wisdom that they've laid down um, in this space. And I want to just thank my teachers and my elders and um, the many women that have poured into me um, as a young person, bringing me up and growing me in our traditions and growing me um, in this knowledge base so that I can carry it and um, share it, you know, and make sure that other young people know it, including my own child. And so today I'm feeling very called to speak about the ways that, um, yeah, my generation is continuing this great legacy that has been left by these incredible educators and uh, stewards of culture and um, and how in this yeah modernity the same systems and the same the same fast moving heavy train that we're all trying to slow down is being tackled um, with the tools that are presently available to us given the internet given social media given um, computer literacy that these young folks have and like what we've been able to do on the ground level um, in the mycelial web of the internet <laughs> to be able to get some work done. So um, as was uh, mentioned before, I am a folk herbalist. Um, I was raised in my mother's kitchen. She's also an immigrant from Italy. Um, and my father was born and raised in El Paso, Texas along the Rio Grande border territories um, with lineage of the Nahuas. So Nahuatl nation in Northern Mexico. and um, 
his father is also Afro-Caribbean. And so I celebrate uh, this very interesting intersection of being Black and Indigenous Mexican and also European and learning how those um, communities get along and how those communities fight up against each other constantly. And um, I, I have to give so much credit to weaving that beautiful tapestry to sacred earth medicines and how they've been able to assist in the integration of uh, all of the beings that I am. And um, not only the being that I am as a you know practitioner in the space, a folk herbalist, a community organizer, but also in those, um, uh, the as we mentioned, you know, before, like that space of rage that also lives in me and that like range of feeling and the disappointment that I have as a young person watching the psychedelic movement happen. And um, I just, I want to honor medicine for allowing me to experience the range of feeling, um, seeing what's happening to the earth, knowing that uh, we are a few generations out of seeing um natural uh, environmental collapsing and changes in our environment so much so that like food and water and access and like basic needs might not be met to all of the people and how are we facing that and being inherited that and how is medicine assisting us in problem solving and and remembering what what we need to do and why we were called to be here at this time and so some of the projects that I'm working on, <laughs> some of those things that I've been called to do in our space is just addressing just tip of the iceberg, the, 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 the great train that has been moving through our communities um, is I work within the space of central assault advocacy. And so what has been very interesting and the legacy of colonization is this normalization of sensual violence among women and children and mothers and all, all sorts of bodies. And so um, that, that <laughs> serpent is also making its way through the psychedelic space um, because of the very unique nature of the dynamics of power, um, how altered states render people um, inert to fight back often, um, already the rate of underreporting among survivors and also the added pressure of having participated in a illegal activity at the time of the harm. And so um, I, with some really amazing other friends and relatives and community organizers have put together a small coalition of people, um, the Matriarchal Alliance for Accountability and Transparency. And um, we hold a really beautiful space for survivors and continue doing education work in our community, um, leveraging the skills that we've learned from our ancestry. So reweaving the tapestry of harm with the power of plants themselves through herbalism, the power of song and the drum that has been handed down by women singers, women carriers, um, gathering in a good way in sweat, gathering in a good way with Los Niños Santos um, and sitting with sacred mushroom together and, and mending the tapestry that way and reconnecting our um, healing systems with the, the goodness of nature. And as she helps us, we do our very best to help her too and recognize that um, the harm that we see with women and hurting the people that carry wombs and all of, all of our children um, is because we harm the earth, that the two are not separate, that harm against women is harm against the earth. And so um, having that be our thesis and educating and mobilizing young people to see something, say something, identify red, orange, and green flags um, and then teaching songs that can help um, protect and also mend has been a great gift. And so I want to thank my teacher, Brittany Jade Wilson, the founder of the Original Instruction School, who's um, also Pueblo Como and Scottish, um, who studied in Peru as well with Quechua women and midwifery to help build curriculums for which the psychedelic and wellness community can um, intake so that we can be and increase literacy for sensual assault in our community. 
So um, that's been an honorable um, assignment <laughs> for sure. It's been a challenging one, um, but very much see that there are wonderful possibilities for remediation on the horizon and people are thinking about this very serious issue and uh, we are doing our best to address those things through mediation, community restoration and justice actions, um, getting money back to people that deserve it, um, calling in harmful practitioners and recognizing that um, sweeping things under the rug just won't do anymore and survivors deserve much better. And so i um, really honored to be able to just share that as a piece of my work um, in sensual assault advocacy through the wellness and psychedelic community. And I'm really grateful to all the people that help each other out in very small ways and um, really feel like a web of trees together, um, being intermediaries of education and intermediaries of resources. Um, not only this, but I do also really deeply acknowledge the legacy of women who have had to hide a lot of their cultural practices because for a very long time, um, we were not even able to practice our own traditional religions and um, ways of life. And so the psychedelic revo you know, revolution, this, this gold rush really, um, everyone out here trying to make a buck, um, you know, the reason we even have this is because people have kept it secret and sacred and um, held very close to the heart um, in their kitchens, in their homes, among their community members. And a really near and dear part for me is recognizing how um, the outward expression of a person's connection to the earth through entheogens had largely become grounds for the removal of children also and um, separating families um, from you know because of our connection to our culture and so i just wanted to name you know um, all of the children and the family members that have been separated because of um, mothers looking unfit because of their relationship to entheogenic medicine. And so with that, um, there is such an interest in my heart to break stigmas around mothers who ingest sacred earth medicine, because not only are they the ones who carry the wisdom, the knowledge of formulation and process and the ritual of doing this work, um, but also they are sharing and that relationship that mothers and aunties have with and grandmothers have with the young in a community is part of the passing of that wisdom. And so for those strands to become broken is fragmenting our world. And um, as a mother who ingested psilocybin mushrooms while pregnant, um, while breastfeeding in my postpartum time, um, have largely turned to advocacy to destigmatize through education and also research for mothers who consume mushrooms while pregnant, breastfeeding, and postpartum. And so I was given permission um, by a, a woman, Chico Sochi, Awalita, and Awala in our community. Um, and she was the first person to give me fresh psilocybin mushrooms while I was four months pregnant and said, you know, um, these are oh, these are safe for you and your baby. And I come from a place where this strand of connection between entheogens and the motherhood experience and the experience of children is not broken yet. And so she ushered me into that um, way of life. And I recognized that this will not be enough. Permission that I received from an elder will not be enough for the Western person to be able to permission themselves or consider this as an option. And so I took to research. And so I think one way that young people and myself included are assisting in like the bridge keeping from the previous generation is also to use our technological tools to help to um, sustain the chain of information. And so I was grateful to connect with um, James Fadiman, who is a grassroots community researcher and has been doing a lot of work with microdosing mushrooms for some time and um, he reached out to me asking about you know do you have any information about the outcomes of microdosing for birthing people and i said well my you know platform has been sharing a lot of information i've been doing a lot of research 
in this space, I wrote a 52 page ebook about entheogens and their relationships to pregnant people from different perspectives with different medicines from all over the world. And um, I told him it was in my heart that I wanted to do grassroots community based research to see what the outcomes of eating mushrooms while pregnant, breastfeeding and postpartum what were actually. And so I think at that moment that, you know, I think this is the opportunity to do that. And I would like to help you get this data and this research. And so he, myself, and another entheogenic doula in the UK, we all um, created a survey, very simple. And I shared it through my social media platform, made um, postcards, handed them out at women's events. And we collected 400 surveys of women that had eaten mushrooms uh, during pregnancy, breastfeeding, and postpartum, and learned so much and was able to give that data and information to him for his book um, and are now publishing the findings in a website so that other people can access the information as well. So um, the way that I've been in some ways instructed to um, bridge what I've learned from my elders and then um, you know, transform it for like the Western mind and the public to really get is very much woven in the Mothers of the Mushroom Project. And so um, I think I, I sit here very much today in um, a liminal space. I'm, I just turned 30 and so I have a lot of time ahead of me, but um, it's really in my heart of hearts to continue the lineage of remembering um, that we not only should be invited to the table, but also recognized as the makers of the table that we're all sitting at and um, acknowledge that it's not too late to rematriate. And so, um, yeah, with highest honor and lots of humility, I just say thank you for um, being the shoulders in which I stand. And it is such an honor to meet you all today. And um, that I hope that you can look at the younger people and with hopeful eyes that some of us are thinking about the legacy and carrying on um, important, important pieces that we are learning songs that we are doing research that we are leveraging our platforms to try to bring good um, education to the people and um, With that I, I feel called if possible to share a short song um, that I learned through, yeah, sisterhood and community. And um, it's in Nahuatl. It's in the, one of the many languages of Mexico. And um, it is part of my ancestry. And it's about giving the gift of, of beauty and of love and information. It's called Chiqui Yewa and Sochi. And um, the translation is Chiki Yewa and Sochi, take this flower. Chiki Yewa y Panoyolo, bring it to your heart. Pampani meets Latsola, because I love you. Pampani meets Latsola, because I love you. Ikano Chi Noyolo, with all of my heart. And so it's sung, it's sung like this. And so, with permission, um, I offer this song to close my time here today. Thank you for allowing me to speak. <clears throat> Bambani meets la sotla i kano chi no yo lo chi ki ye ye so chi chi ki ye ye i pano yo lo Pampani meets la sotla. Pampani meets la sotla. I cano chino yo.
again. That's gonna happen. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Take a moment to take that in. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, for your share. That was absolutely beautiful. Uh, we're very grateful that you're here. Um, and yeah, there's a very interesting point that you've mentioned. And um, one of the things that did stick out was the patriarchal wound um, that I feel may have also inspired this book um, to reclaim the her stories that we know and to reclaim the invisible voices as the book title says, um, to bring them to light um, and to, to ensure that our matriarchal and, and womanhood and sisterhood is represented through, through such important parts of history. Um, so yeah, that was very beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and yeah, to continue um, the event today, we want to open the space for all the speakers to join the conversation once again. Um, we can touch into um, important topics that, any questions and important topics that we felt we want to um, dive into a, a little bit deeper uh, today. Um, um, we do have a, I have a few questions just to get the ball rolling for all of us, but of course um, it would be great to have everyone just kind of jump into the conversation. And um, if you want to, there's something interesting that comes to mind, just feel free to politely kind of raise your hand and we can start the conversation from there from everybody. Um, but I'll start it with a question just so that we can we can all kind of start in the same page. Um, but given everything that we've kind of looked into today, uh, especially the historical aspect of, of womanhood and sisterhood in the psychedelic realm, um, how do you view the historical exclusion of prominent female figures from the narrative of psychedelic history? And what steps? I know that we've talked about uh, certain steps and looking at the future of psychedelic movement. I know Belinda mentioned this um, a little bit in her um, in her presentation as well. But what steps can we take to amplify women's voices as we move forward in the current psychedelic renaissance? I'll I'll, I'll take that question. <laughs> Um, I, I think one of the big things that we really need to think about is our own belonging and where we start from. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I find in this psychedelic space is a lot of times um, because of the um, fragmentation of the family, and that might even be the fragmentation of our mothers and our grandmothers that goes back through lineages, we need to kind of recoup that and, and really start with ourselves. Um, I always share that we cannot love someone else if we don't love ourselves. And so a lot of that healing has to come from, from within. And I think that's the beauty of these medicines. They teach us about that, um, which also, you know, led to another thought that I had that Maria had mentioned, and it's about this remembering. And I think these medicines really allow us to remember those lineages. At least that's been my experience with some of these medicines. So, thank you. I think that's very valuable for people who are living in a modern circumstance where they have not been able to make a breath-to-breath -breath connection with those kinds of traditions, to recognize that the traditions are here and the knowledge and the wisdom that guided our ancestors is here. It hasn't gone anywhere. And uh, I, I've, I've heard people in ceremonies say, take off your shoes and get to know your mother, you know? And I, I don't think that um, 
certainly our ancestors weren't any less perceptive or intelligent than we are. And they acquired this knowledge from the environment in which we are still living. And I think that our attention is a lot of the problem. And that's one of the things that these sacred medicines can really help us with. You know, anybody can wiggle their ears, but not everybody can isolate the muscle that makes it possible for you to wiggle your ears. Well, when you really think about it, a mother, when she's carrying a child within, is also, you know, we, I think about myself, I was a seed of my mother's womb that was then the seed of her mother's womb. And we touch on those sacred spaces as women, um, but I think we forget about that. And the other part of that is that the blood that, you know, pulses within our veins is the memory of our ancestors. And that's the beauty of these medicines. And it was shown to me in a ayahuasca journey, how that DNA comes to life with either song or with rhythm. Um, it kind of just amplifies that remembrance of who we are. And so I think it's really um, important to look at, look at life in that way. Yeah, I'll add something just from a slightly different perspective in that, you know, working as an editor on this, there was also a kind of a, a different level of connections going on. I, I had the pleasure of interviewing some of you, uh, working with some of your texts, but also working with some new voices and new authors, um, some of whom are, you know, women just entering into this space and who were nervous about putting their words on paper or moving into this space. And I, I see this also as a really incredible opportunity to link uh, to link people across time and space and to think about our ancestors, but also these wisdom carriers within our own midst and some of the voices, some of the new voices that are entering onto the stage. And I think, you know, as as women working in this space, creating those platforms is is really is really amazing and looking out for each other and creating that space, which I'm hearing in each of your presentations as well, that that's part of what we're doing here. That's I got amazing. to Maria, and I think uh, we probably, I don't think we've ever finished a conversation. <laughs> um, it started with about four hours and has been going on for a few years now. So the, these kinds of connections that are intangible. <laughs> the, you know, though, Erica, I appreciate your identity as a real historian with real training about how to be a historian. I'm, I'm kind of a, a hobbyist in the world of psychedelic history, but um, prior to reading the collection that appeared in the Shakruna site, I really thought that I had a pretty broad acquaintance with what the, particularly the, the, the things that are of particular interest to women, because of course I started an organization that was on, on purpose for that. But I've been introduced to a whole, uh, a, a constellation of other realms of understanding that they're unfamiliar to me and they're in, they're exciting and um, uplifting to be exposed to because it's hope for the future, among other things. Thank you. Would you like to? Sorry. Sorry, Erica. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was seeing Deborah's uh, comments in the in the chat, and I was going to ask Deborah, you know, what's the next book? Um, wow. We've seen these, you know, psychedelic justice, queering psychedelics. We've got women in psychedelics. So uh, where should we go from here? <laughs> and, and that doesn't have to be just Deborah. Maybe others oh, here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, I've been given my voice back. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, I love the uh, idea of uh, connectedness, focus, focusing on connect, interconnectedness <clears throat> and the connection furthering, leaning in more on the that connection uh, in particular between the North and the South, uh, especially given our location where we are here in New Mexico. Uh, what's next on our horizon here is at Synergetic Press, we're publishing the 13 Indigenous Grandmothers Wisdom book uh, about their lives and their legacies. And that's coming out in October. And uh, we are uh, working actively here to ensure that indigenous voices from, you know, 
all around the area. So the whole, you know, bioregion at least are involved in what is the emerging definition of rewilding or regenerative uh, practices that are emerging in uh, this part of the country. So uh, that's what's next. And, um, uh, uh, but for me, it's fine. <laughs> I, I am uh, particularly moved by what's happening. <laughs> and I'm uh, really glad to be publishing books on these subjects uh, and finding that uh, the challenges of just getting these stories told through a book alone does not uh, uh, cut it. So these gatherings, these uh, 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 these these salons, these uh, uh, virtually as we can do it. Uh, there's uh, you know we're uh, looking at you know more in person events uh, so that we can share and uh, cross fertilize that uh, conversation between the north and the south and. Uh, the the traditional uh, uh, practices uh, and 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 know how with some of the innovative green tech that's coming in. Cool. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Come and visit us in Santa Fe. <laughs> we. <laughs> I, I I'm I'm delighted to hear that the Indigenous Grandmothers book is your next um, offering, because I I would say you know this is of course the the thing about which I'm most excited and interested, but um, I'm very aware of uh, the people from my own cultural environment who um, persisted in their fascination and reverence for these substances when it was a scary, potentially dangerous, very discreditable, reprehended practice are elderly now. And whatever it is that they learned from that collection of experiences, if we don't um, hear it from them now, it's gonna be unavailable. So I think the the wisdom of elders of this culture and other cultures is always a limited time offer and that we ought to make uh, a, a, a strenuous effort to um, hear that when, when now while it's available to us. And um, I'm delighted to hear that that's a project that's coming right up for y'all. Well, and and uh, 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 documenting the uh, you know the next generation, the lore of the um, you know the plant lore, the lore of the Amazon, of the uh, the elders, the plant wisdom, getting that transmitted, all the techniques. Uh, like you say, it's uh, it's going to disappear really fast. It's already just practically a little bit left. Uh, <laughs> so. But Thomas. I'm also, you know, I'm I'm uh, also really committed to the idea that these um, that there's a lot of joy and playfulness and fun and fascination available from these experiences. And I just want to say we did a kind of a, a whimsical thing. The Women's Visionary Council just held an observation of the anniversary of the uh, woman that Erica was mentioning, Susie Rammstein, um, on the 12th of uh, June this year. Uh, this would be a, a uh, hopefully this will be a new international psychedelic holiday in honor of the first woman to take LSD, who was Dr. Hoffman's laboratory assistant. And um, as in the honorable tradition of self-experimentation that was part of the normal practice of laboratory scientists at that time, she took three um, LSD, three doses, 300 milligram doses of LSD as an experiment and um, created laboratory notes for the Sandoz laboratories at that time. After one of those, after the first one of those doses on the 12th of June, 1943, she went home on the tram. So Dr. Hoffman went home on his bicycle, Susie went home on the tram. We've decided that the 12th of June should be a, a, a celebratory psychedelic holiday in honor of the first woman to take LSD, tram day. So I invite you all to think about that as the calendar rolls around to June next year and um, take an opportunity to think about her uh, pioneering contribution and the pioneering contributions of all the women throughout history who've done things like that in addition. Yeah, would there it be good if all of us took some LSD together and got on a tram? I think that would be <laughs> the best celebration for the 12th of June, really. <laughs> Sorry, Deborah. I think um, I think you make it happen. Uh, <laughs> yes, and and Michaela, Mich Michaela, I was going to say, you know, the work that you're doing in that uh, 
uh, that intangible cultural oral history documentation work is, is uh, those are the modern tools that are necessary for that bridge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bring up a very good point regarding that. I think it's really important for us to not look at research from a Western perspective, you know, in indigenous communities. So when you look at indigenous research is really about the stories and mm -hmm. how that information comes and flows in the stories. And, you know, in Western science, sometimes that's not science enough. And <laughs> we really need to shift that, that, that. So mindset. I've been told. <laughs> yeah. And I think the other thing is, is just the, the terminology that we use, you know, it, I cringe when I hear things like drugs and, you know, it, it's that whole thing about energy. When you call something a drug, it's going to work on you in that, that, that manner, you know, as rather than really having reverence for these sentient sacred beings that they are um, and to really honor that. And I think that's a gift that we as women can bring to the table. Also, don't let the territory that's allowed to be identified as science be colonized by people who like to count and measure things. Mm -hmm. You're a scientist. It's it's like letting the territory that's allowed to be identified as patriotism be colonized by by Republicans. You know, right. like right. you can be in there if you want to. <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. uh, and I think you have to hold out hold that out. You know, you have to not let people categorize you in that way. Because there are rules of rigor for all of these things. And I think a lot of the time when people denigrate them, that's because they don't know what the rules are. I think the whole um, absence of, of spirituality, not religion, spirituality, and the sacredness that uh, these medicines bring to the table um, has kind of just been put to the wayside. But yet, in indigenous cultures, it's the main thing that helps to make a person whole. And um, we're losing a miss. We, we have a missed opportunity, and yet it is something that is worth exploring. And how can we make that more a part of the um, psychedelic assisted therapy that is out there, rather than following a Western model mindset? You know, because um, the soul is really something that needs to be nurtured, not put on the shelf and forgotten. Well, I'm that a big fan wonderful. of Vine Deloria, whom I think was a wonderful writer and thinker. And one of the things that he introduced me to was the concept that indigenous science is respectful of the outliers mm -hmm. and and doesn't hold to things that are central, but um, respectfully regards those things because they may be information for things that don't happen very often that people need to store mm -hmm. and, and pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I'm working on a project right now that I don't know if it's going to be anything, so Deborah can't write this down yet, but... <laughs> Um, I started by trying to, I don't know if this is the right language here, but I, I found all of these photographs in an archive and they were 46 photographs of a peyote ceremony that took place. It was actually, I saw this in the chat, it was one of the peyote ceremonies inspired by Quanah Parker. It's a Native American ceremony, but it's the furthest north that we know is uh, legally recorded, at least uh, in Canada, uh, it's northern Saskatchewan. And um, the grandson of some of the people who are pictured in these images um, has become a friend. And so I've been working with his mother, who was an infant at that ceremony in the pictures. And she, uh, I brought them all the photographs and I'm working with a psychiatrist here, a, a woman psychiatrist who's uh, the only um, psychedelic clinic operator in, in uh, my province. Academy Clinic. And we're working together to capture the stories and understand the meanings behind the photographs. And so far, the, the photographs were published in a newspaper, and the people were only identified as peyote man, peyote woman. Um, we now have names for peyote, peyote woman, I'll just say, tell you as Amelia Bautiste, in case you come across this, but hopefully we'll be able to, um, with, the, with the work of the community and who now own all of the photographs, uh, we're working through this. And it's not just a process of naming, but it's a process of learning about the meaning and the stories behind why these photographs exist in the first place and also what they meant and how those stories have been carried now into these other generations. Um, and it's it's been just such a, a wonderful project to work on. We've developed really meaningful friendships. Um, and I'm learning a lot about the pilgrimages that families have been taking for hundreds of years from way up 
uh, in Northern Saskatchewan here, right down to Mexico. And so I, I do look forward, maybe we can make a pilgrimage through New Mexico and uh, also look at some of those kinship ties that have carried those stories and carried that wisdom. Definitely, definitely. And we have to do everything. We have to video everything now, too, yeah. because it's all going multimedia. Write the book. There's a little film that goes with it. it we are moving into a omnimedia, multimedia, whatever we want to call it. Uh, Michaela, you're going to have to help us sort this out. Mm -hmm. uh, but books are wonderful. Books set a certain thing. There has to be a film with it. it it's just it's a new way of learning. And it's on. Uh, but we can't, I really hope that we can find ways to uh, bring to the these uh, uh, tables that uh, the other uh, experiential learning methods uh, to go along with that because uh, without it, we're doomed. <laughs> Just <laughs> Eric, I, I'm really interested in, you know, that that perspective that will be provided because I think one of the things that happens again, and part of this is that division and we separate things because of boundaries, you know, and if you take the boundaries away, indigenous people have, have migrated south and north for, for a long yeah. time, they have been trade routes. And um, that gives a whole nother perspective and meaning to the stories that come to life and that can come out of that. Um, and uh, so it would be really interesting to kind of look at it from that lens as well. I'm really excited. The The elders are definitely leading this project, which is exactly the way I think it should go. And I say project, but I'm just going to put that in quotation marks because right now it's it's whatever it will be. <laughs> I'm not putting a, a setting a particular goal for it. It's really community driven. And I, I think that's wonderful. So I hear you on the the filming part, though, it's definitely on our radar. And, uh, and that's what the community has asked for as well. So I'm excited to be part of it. <laughs> Um, if I might, if I might share too, there's been a couple pieces that have come up around um, archiving multimedia, the many ways of knowing stories as legacy. And um, someone in the chat asked about um, if Mazatec communities would ingest small amounts of mushroom, like we ch like the Widarica community will sometimes do with peyote. And something I just wanted to put into, you know, the circle here is the archival records work that Inti Flores is participating in um, with Esperanza Mazateca. And um, for our sits and circles here in Southern California, we off like offer, um, you know, gratitude to him to continue being in reciprocity with that project. Because what I'm starting to understand is like a young person who grew up in a very academic environment who um, studied English, um, women's studies, gender studies, ethnic studies in school. And like the way that we were made to learn was through like reading and writing only. Um, I found myself completely stifled in just like written words. And really I receive information much better through hearing and through feeling and through like um, seeing and through like visual storytelling. And it wasn't until I found like film and film classes and classes that uh, counted towards my English credits, but were film classes that I like ever thrived. And I just realized that for some people, um, we don't process like written words quite like everyone else. For us, we are tactile learners, we are experiential learners, and that is just as valuable, just as important, and just as um, a helpful means of knowing and learning that is intrinsically folk, that is intrinsically brown, <laughs> that is intrinsically indigenous, like we are artists, like we are singers, we are dancers, and so to try to narrowly engage our consciousness to understanding a topic by what we can consume in written language really like destroys um, the genius capacity that we all have for many different ways of learning and so i just wanted to share in the circle that you know and inti flores who's a brother um is archiving maria Cipina's records like her wedding video her audios that were consensually recorded and um her writings in her own words and so i hope that that can be and for me this concept of like how do we mend the tapestry on women not being included 
in this movement is it's going to take like small, simple, kind, um, focused actions and like concerted community based small level efforts to create like the symphony of effect. And so I, um, I hope that people like feel inspired to participate in a small way in their own home, in their own community, in their own family, um, to just further and deepen the rematriation process, which means also to like honor outliers, honor different ways of knowing something, honor like non-written language ways of expression, like music and dance and seeing that as a very important mechanism for healing, um, honoring like the circle as opposed to the upward facing triangle of things. And um, that like, I really like to recognize the conversation we're having around psychedelics as a conversation about earth and bring like the plant back into plant medicine because a lot of companies have interest in like monetizing and extracting and like, you know, turning everything into a finished product with like a cool label and like profit margins. And as was already spoken in this circle, like building relationship with living beings, like seeing whole mushrooms, like visiting the vine, like visiting where these medicines grow and like situating oneself to preserve and to take care and to literally like lay in, fr in front of a construction truck to save, you know, like a tree is like the level of solidarity, I think that the earth is asking for at this time. And this earth is very much breaking free from a narcissistic relationship with humans and corporations. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's taking kind of all of us to be very ingenious with our creativity, get ingenious with um, our problem solving skills and all of the gifts that we all bring. And so what, how I'm imparting that, you know, to my four year old, right, is like, he watches it, he sees it every day. He has like literacy around ceremony and asking people how they're doing in it and like learning how to build his own fire. And so I just, I pray that people in this community don't jump the gun and say, I was a fortune 500 company owner and I drank ayahuasca and now I wanna be a shaman. When this person's never sang a song in their life or knew how to build a fire or held space for anyone. And so I just, um, I hope that people in this really big conversation don't miss the small steps that it takes to just be good, rematriate, care for the earth, like water your own garden, take care of the people around you. It's not such a big mission, but if we all do the right things together, then um, we can grow goodness in an exponential rate. So um, thank you for, yeah, allowing me to tend to my little corner of the garden and to sit in this garden, shared garden with all of you. And um, I just know, and I hope to speak to that um, it's not all lost, but it has to be, uh, it will be remembered. And it's not gonna always only be remembered by what we read in a book. It will be remembered by reactivating our blood through song, dancing, singing, and doing all the things they told us not to do in school. So um, thank you <laughs> for allowing me to be, yeah, like a wild creative navigating the space of rematriation because I feel like without the body, um, what is that? Yeah, our brother John Trudell says, Without earth, there is no heaven. Oh, thank you, Michaela. Thank you, um, everyone, for that conversation. That was incredibly, incredibly interesting and fulfilling and heart filling. And it's just so nice to hear all of you wonderful women having um, such incredible projects and just incredible ideas and experiences. And it just um, I think as Deborah said, it's really inspiring to just to see these things happening and these salons happening. Um, but we actually might be running a little bit close to the time of the event. And um, so I just want to bring forth some audience questions. Um, and I think Michaela, you were actually speaking now about holding space. I'm not sure if that was related to the, the question that Hira um, has put in the chat. Um, but maybe we can start there. Um, and she's asking, 
Um, she says, I'm curious if there's any feedback for those that are interested in holding psychedelic space for others, if there is any wisdom you can speak to regarding learning and guiding others. And you were already kind of speaking about this anyway. So maybe it was your intu intuitive guidance <laughs> that kind of put it there. Um, but if we just want to answer that question and then we can briefly open the floor if anybody would like to ask some questions, please put it in the chat. Um, and we can take a few minutes for them. Yes, <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> oh, I think Michaela is muted. Um, I think what gets largely overlooked um, in the, with the desire to want to hold space and the desire to want to carry medicine is, um, there are many ways to hold space. There are many ways to be a good listener and a good friend, to build a simple fire for someone and, and listen and allow transformation to happen. And um, I think before like going into um, the environment of, I would like to dose people with medicine, which is such an important and like kind impulse. I feel like we can support people with all kinds of medicines. We can offer someone a cup of tea with rose in it and like potentiate a lot of healing with like a very simple non-risky substance. Um, we can prepare a sacred space. We can prepare a process. We can prepare um, a, a mode of, of actions that produce positive outcomes for the central nervous system of the person and just know that it's not all pomp and circumstance that can like be transformative for someone. Like a song well sung to a friend, with a friend, like in care can be just as impactful as a five gram mushroom experience. And so I hope that um, before people get into the fervor of like, I wanna be thrust into this role, I really wanna help, um, consider the ways that you can already help and to refine those skills and to refine um, the gifts that you have to give and know that that is already space holding. And um, for a lot of us that hold sweat or that you know sit in circles together, it takes quite a long time and quite a lot of um, correction and humility and um, making those mistakes in a safe way so that we can grow towards that place. And so I hope that it's not just the nine month training that you got online that is like giving you that permission, but instead your dedication to um, to safety, to survivor literacy and to your relationship with the earth. And um, I hope that you can learn to brew a cup of tea for someone to build a fire for them and to sing them a song. And if you can do that, maybe we consider putting mushrooms in the cup after. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, for, for answering the question. We have run out of time. We have gone a little bit over. Um, and I'm sure some people might have other obligations today. Um, so I don't know if we have more time for other questions. Um, I do see that there's one other question by Scott, um, but we can maybe answer, we can answer that in an email, Scott, if you'd like to send it, and we can send it over to the speakers so that we don't take anyone's more, uh, time. Um, but yeah, we would just like to have a, a final words. Uh, thank you, Peter, I see that you're back. <laughs> Um, but I just wanted to thank everybody that is here, um, just to thank City Lights for having us here today, Chakuna Institute um, for creating this beautiful book, um, Erica for helping editing it, and Belinda Maria for giving all your knowledge and wisdom of the book as well, Michaela for having beautiful words today, and a special thank you to Deborah and Synergetic Press for publishing the book and for continuing to publish amazing books for all of us to expand our consciousness and knowledge. Um, so just a big thank you to everybody. Thank you, Peter, for being the wonderful man that you are, <laughs> helping host these wonderful women today. Um, so I just, yeah, have any last words just to, to conclude the event? Anybody just want to say any concluding words? No, we're okay. Um... 
See if anyone, I'm gonna let our speakers go first. I just wanna thank you all for hosting this. This has been a real treat. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Fernanda, thank you for doing the honors and for moderating. You're such a great moderator. And, and thank you all, all of our participants tonight for, for being here. It is such a great honor to have you all and have you contribute in this particular way at this time. Um, much gratitude to you all. Also want to extend our thanks to our co-sponsors, the Chakruna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicines for all the good work that they do. And of course, to our dear, dear friends at Synergetic Press, we have had the pleasure of working with them for many, many decades. They continue to produce very significant works of the highest quality. So a huge shout out and thank you to Deborah Parrish Snyder, who's in the room tonight, the publisher of Synergetic, um, in honor of many years of friendship. And thanks to all of you in the audience for animating the room and for having an interest in such important material. Um, it just encourages us to do more. And um, so we'd like to remind you, we have posted the links with which you may purchase copies of Women in Psychedelics. Better yet, if you're in the neighborhood, come on down, browse our stacks. We are located in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. back to our pre-pandemic hours. We'd love to see you. Today's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, furthering the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, into the future. So be well, everyone. Take care. Be kind to each other. We hope to see you all again very soon.